Right, so thank you all for coming to Pullman Police Advisory. We're happy to have you here today. My name is Corey Woodley. I'm the chairwoman of the committee. Uh, so we do have some guests with us today that are going to talk to us from the Police Recovery Center. So we'll talk about that after we vote on last, meeting, last month's meeting minutes. So did anybody have anything to say about the last meeting minutes from April 9th? Anything you want changed? Going to need a motion, entertain a motion. I move to approve the April minutes. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, great. I love how easy this is every month. <laughs> I think I've only ever had three changes in all of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Chief Jenkins, should, should I let you do introductions here? Actually, sure. I, 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 I think that we know, we equally know them <laughs> as much as one another. So, uh, Darcel and Jean, can you just tell us briefly what you guys do at the uh, Police Recovery Center before we get started? Could I ask a question first? Where is the Police Recovery Center? That's at? a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, conveniently located uh, in the same offices as Craig Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> down, on, down on Bishop Boulevard. Okay. In the Pro Mall 2. Okay. So, I want just to tell you what we did. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just give us like a brief overview. I mean, to be honest, I hadn't heard much of the Police Recovery Center before. So I think a lot of us were like, well, we should really know, you know, who they are and what they do, and so that we're able to talk about it with our constituencies and rep represent, you know, having that resource. So if you could just start off with what you do and then go ahead and share the rest of your information, that'd be great. Okay, great. Well, we started in 2001, and we are an outpatient drug and alcohol treatment uh, program. We have different levels of care. We offer different services. We had thought that we might start with what the services we have to offer um, look like and let you know what, uh, what is available in the community. Um, and so I did bring brochures that uh, I can yeah. pass around and you can look at as we Perfect. talk. Um, what, what, what else? We'll just tag team this. Yes, Jean and I'm in. Jean Iverson and we're the co-owners of Palouse Recovery Center and we're both chemical dependency professionals and have been for an incredibly long time when we look at the when we look <laughs> at our brochure we realize how long we've been doing this. yes yes and before we were Palouse Recovery Center we were abstemious outpatient clinic in the same area uh, or the same offices so we've actually been in those offices for uh, the year of the San Antonio game. Yeah, 1994, <laughs> we think. Yeah, 94, <laughs> we think. That's right. So you still operate without patient as well? Yes. Okay. We did. We similarly, and then we took uh, ownership of the program and renamed it Palouse Recovery Center. And so we're a state certified alcohol drug treatment program, and uh, we do evaluations, we do outpatient treatment of uh, individuals, we have group sessions, we have an intensive outpatient program which we might describe in a little more detail in a minute. Um, and then if people need referrals to like self-help programs, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, um, Al-Anon, those kinds of groups, we can do that uh, easily. And then also if people need residential treatment, then we would refer them to residential treatment programs. Probably the closest are either in Spokane or Coeur d'Alene and, and uh, over in Yakima, Sela, um, Sundown M Ranch uh, are the closer ones of the intense, or of uh, inpatient treatment programs. Um, and then we do education, alcohol drug information school, uh, so a lot of people that come our way maybe have gotten DUIs and need assessments and then we assess for appropriate, whether they have a substance use disorder and then appropriate level of care within that. So that's maybe a quick synopsis yes. of the kinds of things we do. Sounds good. Good job. <laughs> Here, I'll pass those around so you all can look at them if you'd like. Um, 
And, and typically, um, so we do get a lot of court referrals. Um, we get employer referrals. We get self referrals. Um, uh, physicians, yes. Um, so people end up coming to us um, in all different ways, and we typically would start with an evaluation. And as Jean was saying, in that evaluation, we determine whether or not a problem exists. And if it does exist, then we determine the extent of the problem and what the appropriate treatment recommendations would be. And for someone who has uh, what we would call substance use disorder mild, which used to be called substance abuse, um, and that describes it probably more than substance abuse disorder mild um, to you. But, uh, but so for someone who has substance abuse, um, that would be an outpatient um, program anywhere from about two to six months on usually about a one time a week um, basis. For someone who has substance abuse disorder, moderate or severe, which would be um, chemical dependency, alcoholism, drug addiction, um, they typically would start either in residential treatment or in intensive outpatient treatment. And we do have intensive outpatient treatment um, available at Palouse Recovery Center. Um, and ours um, looks somewhat similar, but each program would look a little different as far as what um, um, how it was made up. So ours is six weeks long and it's 72 hours over that six week period of time of group counseling. Then they also would do individual counseling um, during that time. We have um, a family and friends weekend um, that is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday where we involve family members or close friends in the person's treatment and they attend with that person who's in the intensive outpatient program. What are we missing? What, uh, <laughs> I mean, we have weekly group, which maybe I mentioned right. already, people who have completed either an intensive outpatient program or a residential program would then quite possibly follow up with a weekly group um, and individual sessions. And we can, we do information and referral like for uh, family and friends or people who just are wondering themselves if they have a problem and maybe aren't they just want to come find out what services are, and we do that at no charge, and uh, just for to try to get people information and help them figure out where they might best receive the services that they're looking for. And then Alcohol Drug Information School I mentioned, which is a nine-hour education class. Generally, that's for people who have uh, gotten into some legal trouble. It's not exclusively for that, but it, Generally, that's the case, but they don't seem to have a, a serious problem with alcohol, and so it's more of an education piece of let's make sure this doesn't happen again. <laughs> yes. And primarily, that is primarily a younger population, so college students end up in alcohol drug information school quite regularly. Um, as a result of either school problems. So WSU, we get a lot of referrals from WSU and U of I um, and court. Uh, and so a lot of times that's where college students will end up being, making up the biggest population of, of that educational group. The, um, yeah, WSU, the Office of Student Accountability, they change conduct. their name, student <laughs> conduct, I student just conduct. never <laughs> get their name quite right sometimes. Anyway, um, a lot of times they'll refer people uh, as well. And then, and then the Whitman County Prosecutor's Office, they'll do uh, their um, contract for dismissal for like minor in possession, consumption, um, those offenses, they'll, they have a program that will include sending people to the Alcohol Drug Information School. So that's probably where we get our referrals and the sorts of things we do. <laughs> so can I ask a couple questions oh, about yes. that before we jump into anything else? So with the referrals, uh, I used to work pretty closely with the conduct board at WSU. Oh, okay. And I still don't, didn't quite understand case to case how WSU would handle that. I'm not sure if you guys know, but was there a mandatory reporting that you guys did back to WSU? if a student 
decided to use the treatment program if they were doing it on a student like conduct like oh this is your last chance before you're kicked out of the school kind of thing if they get in trouble with the police department like what is your role in engaging back with the school on, on that information of whether or not they completed the program so so that takes us into a whole level of confidentiality that um, so drug and alcohol records are protected under federal and state confidentiality regulations so for us to give information about anyone that we're seeing there has to be a signed release of information mm -hmm. um, that's signed by that person there are four areas that that release doesn't that work it's outside of that release of information so if someone planned to hurt themselves or someone else child abuse, neglect, endangerment, um, if they had a medical emergency, and a court order. So with, other than those four times, um, we need a release of information signed by the individual. If a person came in and they signed that release, then we could report to WSU or to the court or to whoever else they signed the release to. If they revoke that release or if they, ref if they don't want to sign the release, then we wouldn't be providing information to anyone such a complex interaction with the conduct board and like treatment and then the police department and like the overlap of information and how like WSU chooses to move forward on their decisions with students so that's why I was asking yes yeah so typically if someone is engaged in treatment they want WSU student conduct to know um, if they're asking for it um, if they're if they're not engaged in treatment then they they probably don't want WSU student conduct to know um, right. and we usually see referrals come after a second strike or sometimes a first strike if it's at the end of the semester but but typically we see people a little bit further along in their student conduct involvement okay. um, than initially so initially I think usually with a first strike unless it's really late in the semester I think WSU typically handles that just within their department but once they get to kind of those second and third strikes that's where we often are seeing the person okay. and I think too if a lot of times if someone has been suspended and it's been an alcohol drug uh, situation they would require some program uh, to do an evaluation and for that person to be able to provide documentation that they've completed the recommended program before they are allowed to re-enroll mm -hmm. okay. um, so it might be us I a lot of times those people may head home mm -hmm. to do that since they're not going to school here mm -hmm. <laughs> so they might want to go home and do that kind of program but we do get people who somehow miss that in their application process and show up and are like okay I need to do this now yeah okay um, I, don't know I have a question yeah um, so you talked about that there's services that are covered by insurance <coughs> companies so if it's not covered what is the financial burden for people who are taking your services very good question um, so we do have um, for people who aren't covered by insurance we have our rate we do not have a contract with the state to provide services for low-income and indigent and so for those people we would generally refer them to Palouse River Counseling Center because they do have that contract to provide um, services so we work with people try to ascertain if they need a referral to make sure that they get that and actually after we do an evaluation we do and let people know that there are two places in in the county that offer these services so it's not like if you come to us for an evaluation that that requires you to come to us for services so people have that choice and and then we try to help people find the one that is going to work for them in terms of financial um, commitment is it pretty expensive um, so for like our uh, groups are 35 <laughs> yes $35 an hour um, individual session $75 an hour and quite frankly we think that's pretty inexpensive from a from a private place and when people go elsewhere they call and 
they might not like it when they're there and then they go somewhere else, they transfer somewhere else and they realize what a bargain we are. <laughs> <laughs> and then evaluations are $120. Oh, yes, $120. So if someone didn't have insurance that would cover it, the evaluation would be $120. Mm -hmm. Did you guys, did you have any do you make an effort to get prior authorization? And if you were to get prior authorization on a case, you submit it to insurance and then it's denied, how is that dealt with? Because I know that that happens in rare cases where they think that they got authorization from their insurance and then they're denied and they're kind of in the hole. I don't know how you guys navigate situations like that. Well, insurance companies are, are um, some of our favorite people to deal with. Yes, I can imagine. Yes. Um, so, so with pre with prior authorization, it typically is pretty easy to get insurance to pay eventually. Um, it's um, so it's pretty rare that we get prior authorization, and we're actually really good about getting prior authorization and making sure even if somebody comes in and says, "Oh, I got this authorized, um, and I'm good to go." We're picking up the phone and saying, okay, is it authorized? Um, because oftentimes people will come in, um, say, with a doctor's referral, thinking, oh, this is what I need for my insurance to pay for it, when in fact we know it's not what they need for their insurance to pay for it. And so we help them navigate that as well. You know, it's, a lot of people end up in the waiting room with their insurance company with us saying, okay, call them, tell them, the, uh, tell them this is what you need um, because you're not authorized right now. So, um, so, but we also, we, we do, we have been known to fight with insurance companies before and, um, and we do, it's usually, yeah, if the door is closed and there's yelling behind the door, then usually that's an insurance company on the other end of the line. That's why you gotta charge 75 an hour. <laughs> all these other hours. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Feels that way. Yes, <laughs> um, but we can't. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we, so we are. We do a pretty good job, I think, of of trying to work with the insurance company and and really not not passing that along to the person, if at all possible. And then we also help them advocate for themselves as well with their insurance company because oftentimes as the policy holder they have much more sway with the insurance company than we as the service provider do um, so they're the ones who are paying the premiums there so so sometimes it's us telling them you need to call this person and and start start complaining them and so so I would say we have fairly good rate of success with with uh, dealing with insurance companies. Yeah. And we are contracted with an awful lot of insurance companies and so, you know, follow their requirements and know what those requirements are. And given that a fair number of our clients are like college students and maybe this is their first situation where they've even had to deal with their insurance company, we try to help them with that. and. If they're up for it, they can call their moms, and they usually do a pretty darn good job of <laughs> following up with things. <laughs> but, um, but that a lot of it, you know, it's a lot of new things for an 18-year-old or 19-year-old of how to deal with all that, and and yeah. so we try to help them with that. And when people come in, we check out their insurance, like either immediately or within a day or two, um, so that we can help them with that because you know depending on if they've got deductibles and all these things they don't even know what that means so mm -hmm. try to help them with that so one of the things we balance at the university is parent involvement with students <laughs> yes i know <laughs> same parents as really same like to be <laughs> yes yes how does that work i mean with especially with 18 year olds can they be involved <laughs> With, a written, what, yeah. with written permission, yes. And do you want to talk a little bit about family, I mean the family program with the intensive outpatient program? Yeah, so, so that, um, so our intensive outpatient program, the one that's intensive, the 72 hour <laughs> one, um, um, that one we, they, they have to bring someone with them to that weekend. And so we really like family members to come because they are typically the people who are closest to that person. And, um, and so we really encourage that at that, um, at that juncture. And, and we do have a lot of parents who 
want to be involved and a lot of students who say I'm not signing a release to them and that makes it really easy for us because we just say sorry um, um, and so um, so and typically I would say probably the most common reason they do sign a release is when it comes to the financial slash insurance piece of it they'll say okay but only they'll limit it right so they can limit a release so they'll limit it to okay only for financial stuff um, because a lot of them don't want their parents involved in this part of it um, and and so in this part of their life um, and and so if they sign a release we can talk to them if they don't we can't um, family and friends weekend we do we do encourage them to involve family members because if they're in that program it means they have a significant problem as well and so that that support really um, is helpful in that situation and we do get parents who aren't happy with us when we tell them that we their child's 18 and has you know we really can't say anything about their involvement without a release and we don't tell them that even if their child was 13 we couldn't tell them anything about a release <laughs> and so it's so actually well. that's that's true too we, mm -hmm. um, so yeah with 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 drug and alcohol records um, yeah, you can really at a very young age decide you don't want parents to know what's going on and 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 um, And that is respect so So it's as low as 13. I disagree with that. That is so wrong <laughs> You will learn seeing as a new parent <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what my understanding of why that is um, is because there are parents who may not um, approve of their child getting help mm -hmm. like may not encourage it because of maybe their own lifestyles and so with outpatient treatment people can actually seek treatment on their own at a much younger age so that's the reason it doesn't always feel right for more involved parents but that is the, it's like that they yeah. can seek some help. There's also they can't others. get residential treatment that way. They do have to have their permission there. Yeah, I do know that there's other things with medical that it's below 18. That, like for my daughter's records, once they turn, I think, 16, I lose access to their records. They have to seek permission. I pay the bills. <laughs> um, quick question though. So back to the financial burden thing. So 72 hours, so that's 72 times $75 an hour. Uh, Thirty-five dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah for the yeah. It's, group one, so the individual is. Yeah. Oh, okay. and yeah. IOP ends up being about twenty-eight hundred dollars. I think is what it is for the that six-week the intensive outpatient program. So then they leave knowing the financial burden. They're never going to do it again. Mm -hmm. That's actually that's really, just, that's that's actually a really good price from all the things I've looked at. So oh. insurance is paying for that too. Right, so yeah, so insurance would, if they met their deductible and things, yeah, many insurance companies will pay for that. Um, there are some insurance companies that for group, they don't even charge a copay for, so literally they can go through the entire, that entire thing without paying anything for it. Uh -huh. um, and so, so it's... Other than their premiums. Right, <laughs> other than their premiums, exactly, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I have sort of a related question to the discussion about under age 18. So if you have a student, and I know that there's weirdness with like WSU being able to notify some parents for like MIPs or whatever, but let's say sort of outside of that situation. Um, if you have a, a student who's still on their parents' insurance, but over the age of 13 obviously, um, and they're using their insurance for services, are there any indications like on an insurance, like would the parent be able to glean what's going on based on like an a bill from insurance yes. or yes. something else? Yes. yes. Okay. I promise yeah, I'm not asking for personal experience. <laughs> 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 no, just like, I mean, anytime you get an, any type of insurance billing, whoever is paying on it, whoever's paying the bill, yeah. you'll get your um, explanation of benefit. Yeah. yeah, and it will say yeah. everything that's on there. And, and I will say, I, I can't think of any 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds who, who are or have recently accessed any services and they didn't want their parents right. to know. So it's, it would be a rare case. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking more college students who are over the age of 18 who, yes. who think they're very much on their own yes. as they sit in my college classroom and then whose parents are emailing me about their grades. So <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. just wondering sort of, even if they don't get permission, there would probably be ways to, for parents to figure out what's going on. And we do, they 
sometimes they do ask us that and of course we say yes that would be a way that they would find that is the explanation of benefits and while it doesn't exactly list what the, I mean it's gonna have codes and things but it would have our name right they can figure it out I imagine <laughs> yeah. Like my I'd like to know uh, uh, Eastern Washington, uh, Pullman, Latah County. Uh, here all this time, uh, the big crisis with opioids, is that the way to pronounce it? Uh, I assume alcohol is a bigger problem in the college communities. Am I correct or how do they, how do they line up? Uh, as, far as, as far as what causes people most trouble, is that? Yeah, because I hear all of this about uh, uh, the op opioid, opioid crisis. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm assuming that's less a problem in our community than in than uh, booze, but uh, I don't know. Probably less of a problem with the college students. So I would say alcohol and marijuana are probably the two big um, things that we see most with uh, with college students. Um, but but there's definitely an opioid an opioid um, crisis going on as well. So but not with not we don't see it I don't, we don't see it so much with like college it, not students. as much. That doesn't mean we don't see it ever. That's well, I you raised another issue. Uh, yeah. Marijuana marijuana is legal, uh, but I guess alcohol is too. Is is marijuana <laughs> a problem? Or? It can be for people. Yes. It isn't for everybody, just like with alcohol, it's not a problem for everyone, but for the person that it is, it can be a serious problem. Oh, and I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's a DUI as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have another quick question. So you mentioned that it's not a big concern with the college students, so does that mean it's a concern with the high schoolers, or <laughs> just thinking of you know, parent of middle schoolers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so no, I, I would say our biggest population uh, um, is not high schoolers or or um, college students. Um, and we certainly see people, but who have issues with opioids, but um, they're more scattered. I would say. Um, throughout and probably I would think tend to be a little bit older um, than a college age student. Um, oftentimes people get um, get addicted to them like for a legitimate medical um, issue, uh, physical pain and then and then they start causing them problems you know as they as they become addicted to them and so um, so sometimes it's a process of, of you know a couple of years um, and so that takes you know, that takes time and so I would say typically they're a little bit older than college students. Do we have a big issue of drugs in our schools? I was going to ask is there a difference between treatment populations and maybe criminal citations the populations there? I have to answer my question first though. <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you. Things can get a little bit. Now. Where you your question? So my question is um, from a parent standpoint of two middle school, is there a problem of drugs in the schools? Are you asking Chief Jenkins? I am asking any of us. Based on what my daughter tells me, yeah. yeah. so the high school, school, yeah. Yeah. So high school so student. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be connected, but my, my question is first. Yeah, very connected. It's a part A and a part B, guys. Calm yeah. Down. yeah. <laughs> so we certainly get referrals from the high school. If someone is caught at a dance or a football game or on campus, um, then, yes, yeah, certainly we get referrals. Um, I, and most of them are not actually legal refer referrals. Most of them come directly through the school, and so um, or, or a parent, mm -hmm, yeah, or that would, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, being the mother of a high school student, I would say that she certainly thinks there is a lot of uh, of marijuana and alcohol use that goes on um, at at the high school. So. I mean, cool. not necessarily at the high school, but among high school, yeah. among high school students. What about uh, what about other drugs? I mean, just coming from Portland, I mean, there's 
lots of stuff mm -hmm. that go on. So is that the same here in Pullman? Like, do we have a lot of drug issues? We're ruining the idyllic, like, view of uh -huh. Pullman. <laughs> well, I'm just a concerned parent. <laughs> Down on Grand uh, so, uh, so I would say alcohol, marijuana, probably um, on campus, uh, WSU, cocaine is is one that we hear commonly, and Xanax is another one. Those those are probably the, the top. What I've never heard of that one. Xanax. Xanax. Xanax yeah. What, what is that? It's a benzodiazepine anti-anxiety oh. medication that is being really great used alcohol. right now. Well, yeah, yeah, right, um, a lot. So those are, and then opiates. Um, yeah. Well, hydrocodone yeah. and yeah, yes, there's and yeah, yeah. There's there's there's, there's that I, one too. We'll throw that I one think in. it's safe to say that anything would be available. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, sure. Yeah. Dark. Yeah. Is it Doesn't more mean available? everyone's using it. Hmm? Is it more available for high schoolers or the community younger population because of the college? I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that that's the case, they, actually. I mean, I guess does the uh, community, people. young people, do they interact with the, and get involved with the college students? That's a good question. Not, I don't, I don't see a lot of that. Um, do you have a so, thought on that one either? No, I don't see a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, of access, I don't see a lot more access yeah. because of, like, yeah. I, I mean, Don't. that's good. It seems yes. like that would be a problem in college towns. So I have a, and not to change the subject, but I have a little bit different of a question. Um, I think a lot of us have been touched by the opioid epi epidemic from family members or friends, and I had a family member that was unfortunately touched by it. So I've gone through all this like insurance and looking through this whole process, talking to officers and kind of delving down deep into it. And one of the main reasons that I've uh, heard that people stop getting treatment and stop getting help um, was one, the financial burden, but two, a lot of the recovery programs had religious affiliations. So like uh, they couldn't find programs necessarily that wouldn't bring religion or, or God into it. So I, I heard um, from several people that it was a really hard process for them to go through that if they weren't of that religious domination or of a different religious dom denomination. What is your advice for dealing with that when people around here are looking for uh, assistance and help? Well, so, I mean, we are not a religious-based program. However, we do refer people to, like, 12-step programs that have what our description would be a spiritual base. It's not any particular religion, but that that may be something that people find useful. But self-help groups will say, too, that they are not a religious program, that that is one um, that might be one avenue that might be helpful for people. So I don't think that if somebody doesn't have a particular religious or spiritual view, that that would impede them getting treatment at most places. Mm -hmm. um, there are some that are, you know, there are some programs that are specific with a religious view. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would think maybe they wouldn't want to go to that one. Right. But <laughs> I think that it was more but, of the outpatient, like the, the next steps with going to the, the Al-Anon and all these other programs like that. So they, it, it does have a, it is, they do call themselves a spiritual program, um, but it really is God as you define it, or, or a something, power. a higher power, something outside of yourself. Okay. So, so that is Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, 12-step support, those 12-step support groups. That and there are other support groups. I won't say there's many, like around here, but there are other avenues um, that can be support groups for people that don't have that basis as well. Okay. And I guess I would say we would really try to work with someone um, to kind of help them along with that mm -hmm. and how to, how to best deal with their addiction. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I bounce back to cannabis? Um, <laughs> so I actually do, I'm a, a graduate student in psychology and so I actually do a okay. little bit of work with cannabis. But my, um, 
question is about sort of where you get people who are seeking treatment or who have been told they need to seek treatment for cannabis use. So um, I, I feel like a general impression is that like cannabis use disorder doesn't exist, right, or that's not an addictive substance. So would you say that you get most of your people for cannabis use that are from like DUIs or MIPs, or are there a decent number of people who like come and say, yes, I have a problem with cannabis use, if that makes sense? I'm going to say that it would be more likely they might come for alcohol use, but then when one delves into their it. use, it isn't exclusive to right. alcohol <laughs> and that possibly cannabis is a problem too. Right, okay. Um, that'd be my, my thought of people that might be coming in not from a, a court ordered yeah. or that, that kind of a way. Any thoughts on that that would be different or? Add to it. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I think that that okay. I think that probably the percentage is similar to people who end up self-referred for alcohol is yeah probably a little less for for marijuana, but 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 I, we still we get some who are self-referred for for marijuana as well, just have identified like the yes, it just doesn't work for me. So yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. I'd like to relate a personal experience here. A couple of months ago, my son had uh, hernia surgery mm -hmm. and they prescribed some pain pills. This is at the hospital here. And uh, okay, I, uh, and some other pills too. Uh, so that uh, certain pills came down and then said, well, you've got to go up to SIDS and take this. And it was uh, opioids for pain. Mm -hmm. Man, you go through a security clearance. I, I had to show my driver's license and sign off and so on. And they said, you, 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 we just can't send these to you. You've got to go up and get them. I, I, th I thought that was very reinsuring. Boy, they were, they were very careful. That's, uh, there have been a lot of improvements on on restricting availability of opiates. Yeah. Now you had to go up there in person and, and ID and the whole works, mm -hmm. you know. With the handwritten, I mean, we're not handwritten, it's with the prescription in hand, right? That's right. Yeah. I've forgotten yeah. That, yeah. So I have a question. So we know we had a lot of marijuana in town before marijuana was legal. Since marijuana has been legalized, are you seeing any trends or anything that you would say that you would attribute to the legalization of marijuana? A lot more marijuana use. <laughs> this is probably what the, that is. That is yeah. resulting in issues where someone would need um, your intervention. Possibly, yes. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, th this is one of those things that people don't think about but for people in recovery our, our office was where it was before the three marijuana shops opened a block away <laughs> but people have to if they're in recovery I mean that can be a trigger they like drive around and come a different way to get to our office and and I say that about marijuana but also when uh, alcohol went into the grocery stores. It's like they have trouble going to the grocery store because of the triggers. So that's where I see more of the concern that it's just like in people's face a lot more than it used to be. Which doesn't really answer your question, but well, I just... Well, we get asked that regularly, and really from our perspective, we, didn't, we haven't seen a huge really change in anything. I know statewide there's a change in DUIs involving cannabis. But when I talk to WSU Counseling Services, they've seen a tremendous change in students on campus that they're seeing because of uh, issues, uh, studying issues and grade issues as a result of marijuana use. I wonder if that's, sorry, but if that's people being more willing to like say they have those problems? That's sure, yeah, that's, that's, hard to, mm -hmm. that's hard to decide. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point because now that it's illegal, there's no reason really to be. Yeah. 
Yeah, because data from Colorado after they legalized before we did suggested that use actually only rose in like older adults, so people over the age of I think sixty. Those were, that was the only age group that was using marijuana more consistently was was mm -hmm. older adults. So. Well, and that's what we're seeing at the local marijuana shops as well. Yeah. It's not as many college students as right. there are the older adults. Right. Mm -hmm. Do does your clinic do? I guess educational services on like safe use of things like marijuana or now that it is legal because I'm sure that was a shock to the system in a way but I don't know I mean maybe people don't know and they're just kind of really easily falling into abuse or something mm -hmm. so no we don't do those programs maybe, but in thing? alcohol drug information right. school which yes. I mean the purpose of that is generally for people who have had driving related um, events and so that is covered in there and in abuse group oh yeah too. that's right so, I guess I do do that. so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was thinking yeah. that you were talking about maybe out in the community more. right that's that's yeah, what and I mean I, more right yeah. oh. so that that Rather was what I was saying no we haven't be been doing anything like that but. I guess proactively I don't know if there is anything necessarily yeah. mm -hmm. WSU does booze sex and reality checks which part of that is like showing students like what a shot looks like so when you say you've had a drink actually you've had four yeah. but I don't know if they've integrated <laughs> marijuana information yeah that'd be really interesting to, to see if whether they've integrated that um, there's a week of welcome where they have those trainings and kind right. Of mandatory right right yeah that's no booze sex and reality checks is in that yeah. set of trainings yeah kind of tied to that what are the indicators for example for someone just using marijuana what are the indicators that somebody has a problem you know versus just experimenting whatever they're doing versus interrupting their lives and actually not being able to go without it like what what kind of questions would you ask somebody coming in to, to evaluate if they have a problem well Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, i didn't I, <laughs> So, so, there, uh, so there is a set of criteria that's used um, out of the DSM-5 to assess for substance use disorder. And so if you actually want the list of criteria, Jean brought them. And, um, and so the, the, these are, you know, this is a sentence that we would probably be asking more in-depth questions about and, and things. But, but if you want to see a list of criteria, then And it's the same along. criteria for any drug use. So mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's not, it's not just alcohol or just cannabis or just opiates. It's, it's these are the criteria for a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see them? Sure. Okay. So I have another question. Yes. So um, talking about the opioid um, issues, so has there been a change or a push to have limitations of when the doctors prescribe medication? So I know when I had, I had emergency surgery several years ago, and I was prescribed a quite a large amount of um, some type of pain control. And I can't take them because I'm allergic to most of them. Um, and so I can't do anything with it. And just knowing that they just did a prescription drug, um, like take back program of how much, I mean, is there anything? Because I mean, there's some of them are prescribing a huge amount of pills and you don't, you don't need that much. I mean, I would imagine that would be a good cause of why people are getting addicted to these. I think, I, I actually don't remember if I saw that it was in Washington that there were some just pretty new limits on prescribing, but I think that it was Washington and that it's a very new um, thing. But really that's kind of with the physicians and their organizations and, you know, on educating about prescribing and it seems like a lot of times the painkillers are good for acute things but they're not that great for long term and they have been being used for long term pain and that there are many other techniques that may be more helpful 
you're kind of nodding your head up and down. You may know more about this than I do. But oh, I don't know. No, no. Okay, uh, <laughs> Washington is, I don't know if they passed or are working well, on passing seven-day limits. So. It was something yeah. really specific. Yeah, so the, um, uh, a doctor could only prescribe for seven days at a at a time. Yeah, because I know when I had mine, this was back in like, I think 2009 that I had this surgery, but they gave me this, I mean, just yeah. an absurd amount. Yes. And, you know, it just sat in our cupboard forever. And so I was just curious, maybe that would be a good thing. But if you're saying that it's only seven days, then that's good. But yeah, but like I said, I don't remember if they did implement that or if that was just like being discussed or... Yeah, me either. <laughs> Excellent. I thought maybe we but, could tag you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like we both heard this. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, interestingly, in, again, in Colorado, um, opioid overdoses actually went down when they legalized marijuana. So that's sort of like an interesting interaction because you still see problems with marijuana, but someone might argue that opioid problems are worse, so this is like weird balance of hmm. trying to figure out those two things. Interesting. Your science knowledge for the day. <laughs> so, would you guys recommend treatment if someone came in if they were in the two or three area? So that they met two or three. Um, so that is what our that would be substance disorder use disorder mild, and what um, what we would usually recommend is more of an educational and decision making program, which is what. One of our groups is aimed at that level okay. of um, of treatment. So they do they do um, usually alcohol drug information school, which is a nine hour educational course, and then eight weekly groups and an individual session at the end of that. Okay. So it's about yeah it's about a two month what eight, less than twenty hour type of yeah mm -hmm. intervention where they're. Um, and that's where they are looking at, okay, how can I, um, if I want to continue to use this substance, how can I use it in a way that's not going to continue to cause me problems, like whatever problem it ended me up here. So, um, so that's the aim of that is to, um, to help them identify how they can go about um, if they want to continue to use um, so that it won't cause them problems. So. Okay. Do you have any... What's your success rate, or do you know? So most of that, um, the kind of statistics are more gathered by the state and not us individually. We do know that most people complete our program. That part <laughs> we do know. Um, but in terms of just being able to say, oh, yes, this is our success rate, we don't have that information, but the state collects that kind of information, um, which indicates that treatment is a useful thing. <laughs> if, at what point do you say you belong in inpatient or send them oh. to another? What point? a good question. What, a, what an ASAM question. Yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> so ASAM is American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria, there's, there's criteria for making a diagnosis, that's what you've got there. Um, then there is criteria for placement and treatment, and it's pretty specific about um, looking at like withdrawal potential. I mean, here, here's just a simple example. Somebody comes in in withdrawal, uh, probably sitting and talking to one of us is not a very good plan at that time. They need to be in the hospital or they need to have detox. So you first assess for withdrawal potential, then uh, physical um, issues, you know, if you're, not, if you're so sick or having medical problems and need to be in a hospital, that should take priority over um, over talking to someone. Um, emotional behavioral issues, so if people are having some other emotional problems or behavioral problems, assess that. Um, treatment, let's see, they changed the name, it's a, a readiness to change? Yes, okay, exactly. readiness to change, so there are people that are very anxious to do something about whatever their issue is, and there are people that are not at all anxious to do that. So assessing that range, and then relapse potential, and 
an example would be, you know, maybe you're really ready to change, but you live in a rug infested house. <laughs> that might be really hard to do. So you assess the, that, that, or just the relapse potential, the people that they're around, the support they have in their life, um, or the non-support that they have in their life, and then also their living environment, which I guess I'm edging into that one. So all of those have different um, levels associated with them and, and we evaluate that to make a determination whether they would be best served in like a residential facility. There's a higher level than residential is residential with a medical basis um, or a co-occurring disorders program that has both mental health and substance abuse and then lower would be like the intensive outpatient and lower than that would be uh, outpatient, which is like one time a week or less, or nine hours a week or less. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, less sorry, nine, nine, hours. nine less than nine hours a week. And then, um, or there's even like just education, like kind of an early intervention type thing. So, so that was a long-winded answer to we look at we use that criteria to help make a determination of what level of care a person would um, need and then additionally we would probably you know you try to start people at kind of the lowest level of care they need but if then they're not successful then raising up that that okay. level okay. makes sense so and, and also that's insurance companies dictate some of that and so if uh, so sometimes people come in and they want to go to residential treatment we think residential treatment sounds like a great idea for them and their insurance says mm, no we're not going to pay for that Since they're all medical practitioners and counselors right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, or they'll say you know try, try it at an intensive outpatient oh, okay. level and see if that's sufficient and maybe but yes. a lot of times people need more yes and that and that is a that is one of the things yeah. we get to is okay they haven't failed at intensive outpatient yet let's try them an intensive outpatient first and so that's the way people get to residential as well is that if they're not able to um, to be successful at an intensive outpatient level then residential treatment is a good next option it's really an intensive outpatient you need to have some commitment to staying clean and sober and you have to be able to show up mm -hmm. and if those things are uh, particularly difficult then that's not going to be a very effective level of care last question I swear then I let <laughs> ask anything else they have to ask but so you guys talked a lot about um, having group activities and then another pr program where you bring the family involved um, and I wonder if you ever have situations where that makes people uncomfortable if they have poor relationships with their family or if their family are also substance uh, abusers so yes it makes people uncomfortable um, it, not everyone um, and uh, I guess we think it's so important that we ask that they bring someone we don't dictate who they bring um, and I would say it's the thing that most people are the most apprehensive about is that first day of the family and friends weekend and I also think it's generally the thing they find the most valuable once it's done okay. so yes they are concerned about that worried about that and yet often find that rather freeing to be able to be honest about what's going on. Do you want to add more to that? <laughs> uh, no, just that we, we do have people who say, no, this is too uncomfortable for me. I'm not going to invite my parents or whoever it is. And so they often end up there with somebody else, um, with a, a significant other or um, a friend or you know, just, you, you know, Whoever they, whoever they decide to bring. So, right, we don't tell them they have to bring a specific person. So they get to decide who they bring. They just have to bring somebody. Okay. Perfect. Are there any other questions? I know I asked most of them, so I feel bad for taking up all their time. If you have more, we can do an information and referral session. <laughs> so we schedule. Or, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you.
thank you for yeah, having us. Yeah, yeah, so much for joining us. Really appreciate so. that. It's great to know who you guys are. And uh, I mean, a lot of what we do is we kind of pay attention to what's going on in our communities and our constituencies, our neighborhood, and we try to listen and reflect. And at one point, I had a parent come up to me who had concerns of their child having an addiction. And I said, you know, I should know who to go to here. I should know resources to ask, and having you guys come here helps us be good advocates to our community to be able to say we know a place you can go <laughs> to talk to somebody. So it's great, and we really appreciate you have, having you here. Thank you. And Thank I did you. need some cards, too. Does yeah, anybody want cards? Yeah, perfect. Sure. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for these materials. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. Yeah. And I just want to thank the, Pul thank the Pullman Police because as I and you two have both here, they're responding to our office because the alarm is going off. Are you serious? Oh. <laughs> That's why I had to step out. Oh. As, uh, oh. So I, I think well, one of our associates us. set the alarm incorrectly. Oh, Say what? Yeah. I think one of our associates set the alarm Oh, okay. Darcel, I'm sure your phone has a, I mean, a message on it. That is buzzing. Huh? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So I appreciate the police for responding quickly. Yes. Well, <laughs> the majority of people in the building aren't there. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> All of a sudden, I'm like, I'm really hoping I wasn't the last one to leave. I wasn't. I know that. Um, <laughs> George left a couple of messages before the police started calling. Oh, okay. He's <laughs> going to assume. Okay. George's fault. I don't know George, but. <laughs> George is a fictitious person we blame when they. <laughs> meeting or was well it, were they scheduled for today? we were supposed to I was supposed to send him a reminder email but Duffy was gone last week so I didn't do it oh, okay. <laughs> my bad. Uh, it's Darby's fault first George not Darby okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we do have uh, new member applications um, we have Angela is that correct here with us today uh, we had another applicant as well for another area, but uh, I think we'll give them an email and see if they're able to come to our next meeting. Uh, and then I'm just going to pass it off to Chief Jenkins to talk to us. Well, wait, we'll do that well, after. Yeah, so. <laughs> wait, sorry. If, uh, Angela, if I could, in fact, if you could just go to the microphone and uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about your interest in the uh, committee. Sure, absolutely. Stand behind the fancy podium with about <laughs> 10 of you in the room, but I'm sure that's so I can be on the YouTube channel. That's Actually, so popular. hold on one yeah. second, because are we supposed to pause before? When we talk about it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah just right, go ahead. Just just sorry. Proprietary <laughs> talking about me, please don't care. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> so my name is Angela Center. I have been in Pullman since 1998 when I came over from the west side to attend WSU, an undergraduate degree in education. And then after that, I taught at the Colfax School District for several years. I uh, took a little break from teaching and came back to WCU, got a master's in education with an emphasis in adults and underrepresented populations. And then I worked for Dr. Malore and the Miller family in Colfax, if you're familiar with them, in healthcare education. So I ran the CNA um, continuing education program in the state of Washington. So if you have a CNA caring for you, their education credits were all written by me. It's still the program that's in use right now. And now I currently work for the Carson College of Business as their event coordinator and just accepted a nomination for a clinical professorship with our School of Hospitality Business Management. So I'll go back to teaching, thankfully. Um, I guess why I am interested in serving on the council would be when I did my undergraduate here. I had a lot of great mentors. I had a great lot of great people that were helping and making sure that my needs were met as I was here. 
I grew up on the Lummi Reservation, so I'm Samish Indian, which is part of the Salish Nation. Uh, it was quite a culture shock to leave the reservation and come to Pullman, so it's very nice to have some mentors and some people that had some cultural background that could help me make that transition. So I'm at a place professionally now where I have the time to do that and the skills to be able to give back to my community. Um, so I know there's two positions that are available. One was the alternate for multicultural and one was alternate for WC faculty staff. So either one of those two is, is appropriate. I currently sit on the Native American Council for faculty staff at WSU and I'm a Native American mentor to our students. So there you go. Do well, you have any you so questions? Much. I have a question. Oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, so please tell me about this clinical pro professorship I have yet to so hear. So that's of. new. So Stephanie doesn't know that. And um, so Stephanie and I work together. Oh obviously. God! I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Creeping yes. hard. Yeah. Okay, that's so yes. So Nancy Swanger, who is the chair of our hospitality business management department, will be adding some classes to her curriculum that fit right in my niche as event planning so I will be taking over those as soon as they come on board plus possibly some one credit leadership stuff that's coming through with rugby thank you for rugby. awesome you are you going to continue doing the event coordination I will continue better. to do the event coordination this is um, one of those things that just keep you just keep adding yeah, yeah that's how academia seems to work you just you add titles and everything piles up yeah. we just yeah <laughs> You said you're uh, appropriate for two slots that are open. Which would you prefer to fill? Uh, I, it's probably more appropriate for me to fill a multicultural position only because I've only been at WSC for two years in a faculty staff position. And I was there for seven years as a student. So I mean, do have that tie. Two degrees, I wasn't just slow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to cap that. Uh, so it's probably you know, more, more applicable. Um, the really nice thing is the Salish Nation actually includes the Nimipu, which you would know as a Nespur, so I actually can understand people that are here. So Tatsmewi, that's a good day. Um, so that's kind of nice. It's, it's been a little bit of home while I've been here. Any other questions? Any other questions? How did you find out about the council? Uh, I was actually on a Facebook post. So good we, job, Darby. Yeah. Good job. That's good news. Darby saves face. Good. So part of what I do for WSU in the marketing communications department is monitor social media posts. So we look at things that are trending, and then we also look at a lot of things that go on through Moscow Pullman Daily News. Pullman Police are two of the ones that we check almost on a daily basis to see what's going on in social media. Very cool. Our social media is so fix your LinkedIn profiles, people I look y'all up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well great. Um, we're just gonna discuss a little bit amongst ourselves, so uh, and then we'll step in the hall for a minute and I'll come out and get you. Right. I didn't wait for a little secret. Pardon me? Give him we the wait signal. A little secret oh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
actually didn't know that she did know that because I was a couple months old. Well, you know, I'm all the way up on the very top floor. It's kind of hard to get, you know, information up there. So, Angie. Isn't it just one floor? Uh, how would you like your name well, spelled on your tag? Between the two. Um, Angie. Angie. Yeah. Hi, E. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to decide to place you in a category at the next meeting. Our other applicant applied for both as well, so we figured we would see how that uh, interview goes, and then we would decide at the next meeting what category we would place. Both of you in this. Perfect. Okay, great. Just wanted to keep you updated on that. All right, so we're done with that part. All right, so since we have so many people here to volunteer, <laughs> um, Art Walk is on Saturday, and I put us down to have a booth there. Anybody want to? Yes. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had a booth at this. No, no, no we no. haven't. This is so. the first one where they've actually had booths. Okay. What is the 130th year that Pul since Pullman became an incorporated city? What is Art Walk? It's big and oh, what is that first? Well, I'm so you, much in the name. Usually like, they. Well, that. I understand walk around and look at art, but like. <laughs> <laughs> where is it? When Wait, is yeah, it? all that okay. kind of stuff. Yeah. What do we have Parking. to do? Well, well technically, it it's a full weekend thing, mm -hmm. and they have some events where, like, I mean, Darby, do you know what they're having Friday? Um, I don't know. I know that the big. The part that's different this year from what it usually is is Saturday when Olson Street will become a street fair with food trucks and vendors and things to celebrate Pullman's 130 years. So they tied that in during Art Walk. So that's the only part that's really different from what Art Walk usually is, which would be just the artists partnering with the businesses. Right. And then you like food typically Art Walk, we, we just walk around in the businesses, view the art, get some and then pretty exciting. On Friday they have like a speaker somewhere. <laughs> They're coming from out. So I heard the conversation you guys had. Oh, so if I volunteer, can I get a ride in the ATV too? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, if you meet us at the police department, <laughs> I'd like to set it out that I'm only participating in Lentil Fest if we get to drive around the ATV. You know, I, 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 I did not realize we had so many troublemakers on this. <laughs> Again, you, you have to realize that by now. This is a problem and not yeah. a me problem. Our process is not working. <laughs> What are your feelings on this? Oh, well, right. <laughs> Greg's going to have to get a lot more involved. A lot more psyche now yeah. before he be on this committee. <laughs> oh, I teach so what does volunteering class. entail? Pardon me? What does the volunteering entail? What do we need to do? Stand around, give out cards, talk to people about what police advisory is, and just... Wear your shirt. Yeah. Do you guys have your shirts? Some of you. Well, no. We can have. Well, have some. <laughs> I was shirts. never asked for a shirt or anything like that. Oh, really? Some yeah. of you came yeah. after the shirts, and but we've had a bunch of transitions <laughs> since then, so I have some shirts. Mm -hmm. So, I'll just need sizes, and I'll see what I have. I think several of you have shirts, right? I have shirt. Yeah, <clears throat> probably just a few. I don't. I don't but have a shirt. We'll right. have some brochures uh, on various topics like our uh, drone use in Pullman or crime prevention type things that you, know, you can use to hand out just to engage people to let them know that the committee exists and mm -hmm. why we're here. Will the drone be the there? Child ID kit? Um, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if I'll have somebody the drone. with a drone. <laughs> no, you. ATV. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. No, 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 we would need someone to man our booth till 8. So, yeah, setup is from 7.30 to 10.30, and then the booth has to be staffed from 11 to 8, and then takedown starts at 8. Okay. So from 11 to 8, I'll be there all day. Anytime there's an event like this, I'm there all day. It's nice to have two people there. One, so I'm not alone. Two, so we have better representation. Mm -hmm. So And if you need to pee. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> nice, too. Get popcorn, you know. <laughs> nice but it would be great anyone who can join uh, that would be great I can be that kid. thank you so much yeah perfect so and if you guys don't want to be there the whole time you guys can email Darby about you know the time you can be there uh, and then we can just prepare to have people down there at those times maybe I'll take a break if a couple of you are there at the same time during that time you guys Otherwise. are positioned right next to the food truck court oh I'm just saying in case that helps and in fact, if you don't have a shirt and you want to take one with you and then you can try it if it fits, keep it. If it doesn't bring it back and swap it for another one, you can do that tonight at the end yeah, of the meeting. Yeah, I think I have some in my box. Sure, that's so prepared. Yeah. So if you want to grab a shirt, that would be great. Um, 
Thank you guys for volunteering. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it. And it's just Saturday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the Friday part, they're, they're not going to have any booths down there for it. But maybe we can send out an email and see if anybody else is yeah. interested in, in coming or down. tell them that we, they've been volunteering. Yeah. The, <laughs> tell them that they were here. Volunteer. Volunteer. Yeah. They had to be there or else. <laughs> they thought that... Or we thought that them not showing up tonight meant that they were willing to volunteer. <laughs> right, time. exactly. That was yeah. an exchange of time there. Yeah. <laughs> I do have to add one more thing. I know that we're running a little later than usual today, but uh, many of you know that we do have a vice chairwoman, uh, Charlene, but she has been sick uh, and unable to come for a while. Uh, we have not heard from her any time in the last few months, so we've made the decision to bring this up with the committee and, and see how you guys feel about this. Uh, I'm a, a new mom, and you, some of you know how that is, <laughs> so balancing things has been a little bit tricky, being the, the chairwoman without having a vice chair there to help, help things along. Uh, so I would like to entertain a motion to move her out of the chair position, leave her on the committee until we get to you know, talk to her one-on-one -on -one about this again, and if she decides she wants to do chairperson again in the future, she's still eligible to do that. I just think we should make uh, a motion to move her out of the chair position and um, discuss, uh, let people email Darby if they're interested in the vice chair position, and then discuss uh, and vote on a new vice chair at the next meeting. So. And Corey and I have both tried to communicate with her uh, recently, and we haven't gotten a reply, so. I, I don't know that she'll be participating soon. Yeah. yeah. And I will be in, her, in touch to let I'll send her another follow-up email after this meeting just to let her know uh, what decision we end up making. Uh, it's just important for me to have a vice chair. And just generally, what would the duties be? It's really not that much. It's just, uh, you know, helping agenda setting sometimes. Like if we can think of speakers or topics, that kind of stuff. We really all participate. We really all do that anyway. It would be leading a meeting if, if I couldn't lead a meeting. Sometimes uh, the police department does interviews and I think that they send out uh, notifications to the chair and vice chairperson first to see if we can assist with interviews. Um, we, I would always assist, typically always assist <laughs> if we have an applicant who applies an interview and if I wouldn't be able to, a vice chairman, vice chairperson might be able to come in and, and help with that interview. Uh, and then the other interviews would be like if they're hiring a new officer uh, typically, either the chairperson or vice chairperson will volunteer to be on the hiring committee or even another person on the organization if we can't get one or the other of those. So is there any other stuff? I mean, annual report is something that I would like the vice chair and chairperson to be more involved with. I know Darby's taken on a lot of that, but when it comes to writing that a police advisory section, it would be nice to for us to take a little bit off of that, off of her, and, and put some of that together ourselves. Um, do I have any questions about that? I uh, just one question. Yeah. Not that Angie has to do this, but since she just got voted in, would she be eligible if she so wants to? Uh, you know that's a good question, and to be honest, I mean not a lot of Richard knows how I got in on this. I I was elected to the I, I got onto the committee. Uh, in the at-large position, and three meetings later, I was the yeah chairperson. <laughs> so, so probably yeah. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it wasn't by choice. I wanted to volunteer. I wanted to be vice chair, but there weren't anyone else willing to step up to vo nominate themselves to be the chairperson. So. I ended up in this position, maybe way less experienced than Arlene was, and if you haven't met Arlene, you should, because she was great, but uh, I'm still learning uh, to the point in which she was involved, but she was doing a lot of stuff, but yeah, so technically anybody can. There's nothing in our laws that say a new person couldn't, it's just, we like you, but to. You, by the way, are doing a good job, so. Oh, thank you, I appreciate <laughs> so. it, thank you. So. Uh, you, Feel free to email Darby. You can share your interests in it. Uh, typically, if nobody shares interests, then the chairperson will, or somebody on the committee will nominate someone, and they can decide whether or not they want to accept the nomination. Or anyone, even any, anyone, Jaya can decide to, I want to nominate this person because of this. Anyone can really nominate somebody. Do you think I covered that OK, Gary? So I would need a motion 
to move Charlene off of the chair p position. Seems reasonable. I would make a motion to remove her from the vice chair position. Okay. All right. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that I will send her an email letting her know we're doing that and then once again, hopefully anyone who's interested can send Darby an email and then we can get that redone at the next meeting. So let's see. Oh, sorry to pass this to you so late, but Chief Jenkins, can we have our police department up there? Right, right. I'll get done way before <laughs> seven. Can, can okay. Okay. <laughs> so we still have one records vacancy that uh, we have a person um, that's in the process that we're doing the background. Uh, so that we fill our last vacancy in records. Um, we had three police officer vacancies. Uh, one of the reasons I'm wearing a uniform today is because we did a swearing in ceremony for one of the police officers that we hired. He's a lateral from Oak Harbor Police Department, but he's from this area. He um, went to Colfax High School, went to WSU, and um, was an intern with WSU Police Department, worked for the Sheriff's Department as a correctional officer for a couple of years, and then he got hired by Oak Harbor, but uh, he and his wife want to come back to Pullman, so, uh, so we hired him. So he was a good addition. Um, we had two others that we were finishing backgrounds on. I just made a final job offer on one of those today. Um, his name is Love, L-U-V, that's pronounced Love, St. Andre, uh, he's um, he went to WSU. Didn't he go to WSU as well? Mm -hmm. And uh, he lives on the west side right now with his um, uh, significant other and child. And so he'll be going to the police academy in August. Uh, so we're going to have him start with us uh, in on, in July. Uh, August was the first academy we could get him into, and that'll be the Spokane Academy. And then well, there's one other applicant that's just finishing his background right now and hoping to make a final job offer to him and um, have him in the same academy. Um, so that would fill our three current vacancies. Um, so the city council met this last, uh, this Saturday uh, to talk about goals and those types of things. and. Um, both the fire department and, and the police department made presentations to council recently on staffing issues and staffing requests. So they did discuss that on Saturday, and then and I was notified that they are going to be authorizing us to add three additional police officer Great. positions wow. to the police department. Uh, so I'll be going to council on the 29th to take that request to them, and so we'll be able to. Uh, we already have a continuous police officer recruitment and process right now, so uh, we will be, be able to use that process to find three more candidates that we can put in the academy. So, Are those immediate? It is immediate, uh, but what that really means is uh, we, by the time we go through the initial selection process and then backgrounds, uh, probably having someone hired in about um, five or six months. Sure. And then... Um, getting them into an academy and then graduating from the academy so we're you know we're it's a year process yeah, we're like mm -hmm. a, yeah a year process right? that's not like a biennial hiring plan or something. no no so um so it was extremely good news uh yeah, it and it's news. been uh i've been asking the council for a number of years to to increase our staffing um and i think that will get us partly to where i think we need to be um, I think we need to be right now at about 35, but it's a huge step towards that. So it's very good news. Um, and along with that, Officer Matt Burkett uh, is going to be moving to Alaska. And he has given his notice, and he'll be leaving us mid-June. Um, so that's uh, another vacancy that we will. We actually have someone on our current list that we've started a background on, uh, and if he successfully passes the background, he'll be uh, Burkett's replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have in-car cameras are fully deployed in our in patrol. <coughs> uh, we got a grant from the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, uh, an equipment grant, and they funded the in-car cameras. And so um, uh, back when we implemented the, our body-worn cameras, we had an aging in-car camera system that we phased out. 
uh, and so we've been we've just been using body worn cameras uh, since then, and really since 2013. And uh, the manufacturer that makes our body worn cameras has in car cameras, and so those are the ones we purchased. They're compatible with all our body worn cameras and our storage and uh, retention system for videos. So uh, it'll be a good addition for us. Uh, I, I emailed out uh, two of the first weekly recaps that we're now producing that uh, go along with the city supervisor's email that goes to all employees and city council members. And so that, I think that just helps educate the council on what our activities are uh, on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, so it just took two and we got more people, so those uh, turned out to be really good. So I'm just, actually I, I don't think it was those, but um, it, I think it helped. Mm -hmm. uh, we also implemented what's called crimereports.com, which is a public-facing crime mapping system. So if you just go on the computer and type in crimereports.com, and if uh, you have your computer set up so that it knows your location, if you just say explore a map, it'll go right to Pullman. Otherwise, you can enter Pullman in and it will bring up Pullman. It'll show up just the previous six months worth of police activity and crimes. It's customizable, so you can select specific time periods within that six months. You can also select whatever crime or activity you want to see. You can set up an alert for uh, activity near an address that you select. So it's very customizable for the user. Um, so that's crimereports.com. We should put that on Facebook. Or yeah, we should. Or it should have gone out the day we announced it last week, but we'll, I'll put something out about it again. Um, Mary Jo Gonzalez from WSU um, asked me to co-chair the search committee for WSU Associate Vice President of Student Affairs and Dean of Students. So I started on that last week. Um, and so that was, um, I was honored to be asked to be part of that. I don't know, it, it seems a little bit unusual. I think most of the time those committees are made up exclusively of WSU people. So uh, I know Mary Jo has a, very strong commitment to collaboration with the community, and I think that just reflects um, her uh, commitment to that. Uh, so uh, I'll be part of that process. Um, so on the April 17th council meeting, uh, I brought to council a discussion item to talk about potentially raising parking fines. Uh, not just downtown, but also throughout the city. They haven't been changed. Uh, I think the most recent ones have been changed in 2005, and then other ones, it's been as long as 2000, year 2000. So um, they've asked me to come back with uh, some proposals, which include uh, downtown parking will go to a progressive structure. So the first fine would be $30. Um, the second fine would be uh, I'm not remembering the amounts, but it goes to, I think, 50 or 75 and then 100 for the third uh, fine. And actually, that's the fourth one because uh, we give first offenders a warning. Mm -hmm. So the first time someone violates the overtime parking in downtown, they get a warning. Then the next time, they would get a $30 fine and go up from there. What is the fee right now? Yeah. Oh. So most, most people view it as a parking fee. Because if you get caught a few times and you only pay ten dollars a time, that's pretty cheap parking fee. So we decided to make it more of a fine structure. Than the um, but along with that, uh, there's a new organization that has formed called the Pullman Downtown Business Association, and they that group is working on a parking plan for downtown. Uh, so they're looking at different things um, to really address the parking situation long term. I have heard you say before that you kind of appreciate the parking fee, especially for overnight parking, if it is a better incentive for people not to drive overnight, though. Right. So do you think the higher amounts would 
kind of hurt that? Well, if, if someone, my, my practice is if someone decides to leave their car on the street uh, when it's prohibited overnight downtown sure. because they've been drinking, then I will void those tickets. Okay. Um, once or twice, but sure. after that. <laughs> You've got Uber used, now. Yeah. Find, find a new place to live. <laughs> Um, April 25th was National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. And, um, I think Stephanie mentioned that. Uh, on that weekend, we took in 11 and a half pounds of prescription drugs. That's a lot. And of course, we have a, we have a, a deposit box in our lobby that we take it 24/7. So we take it all year long. Uh, April 27th, we had a stabbing. It was, that was a Friday at about 7.45 p.m. at 11.25 Northeast Valley Road at the Apartments. And basically everyone that was involved in that incident is not cooperating with us. They know who did the stabbing, um, but they don't want to tell us. Most everyone involved was from the west side of the state. They were visiting people that uh, live in that apartment complex. Um, there were s uh, some of the people that were involved in that incident we're also involved in the uh, drive-by shooting that we had last year where two people were shot. And it was a similar situation where nobody wants to tell us any information. Is that gang related? Well, I, I don't know that it's so much a gang than it is uh, maybe more a cultural issue. Hmm. So we're, we're just not, the, we're not having any luck with any leads. Um, we have some independent witnesses, but they weren't very close. And we do have some physical evidence that we've sent into the crime lab, so that's what we'll have to depend on to, to identify anyone. Uh, on May 8th, I met with the incoming ASWSU president and vice president, Savannah Rogers and Tyler Percham, or Parcham. And uh, so we talked about ways that we could collaborate through uh, their term next year. And then I also asked them uh, to fill the ASWC representative position on our uh, police advisory committee as well. Uh, coming up, I'll be attending the Washington Associ Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs Conference, which is going to be in Spokane. It's May 22nd, 23rd, and half a day on the 24th. We also have an annual city tour that is this year will be on June 7th. If you haven't done that, it's uh, I would recommend it, particularly you know, for members of the committee. And they will, uh, they'll start right here in City Hall. And uh, the mayor's usually here and the city supervisor. And we'll talk about, um, about the city operations and then walk over to the police department. And we do a tour there. And then they put you on a bus and you'll go tour in different um, facilities in the city. The wastewater treatment plant, fire station, uh, parks and rec, uh, equipment and rental division so you, you get a good overview of the operation of the city and that's on June 7th and so if you have an opportunity to, to do that um, I would take advantage of it do you need to sign up for that you don't you just show up and I think it's at 8 they I think so I can send out I'll send out the info about that uh, that's all I have Great, thank you so much. Ah, uh, I didn't make it. <laughs> 701. <laughs> 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 Does anyone have any questions? Okay. You know, there's been a lot going on in the community lately, so you guys have been busy. But, um, so, typically, what we do at the end is we do our constituencies poll. We go around, we say the area that we represent, and then we uh, talk about anything going on. For example, uh, I'm in the business community, which is kind of really an at-large because I do an online business, but so any, any, really anything I hear I can talk about. Like if, if neighbors have concerns about traffic violations or anything like that, then I would take those concerns and I'd bring them to the community and I'd share them. But um, do you want to share anything today, Angie, or should we go on to Richard? Because I'm sure it's your first day. So. Well, I guess it depends on what half of the spectrum that I would be on. But, um, <laughs> WSU is pretty quiet right now. Yeah, I suppose. And I would add to what Corey said is that regardless of what constitu constituency you represent, any concerns you have yeah. that impact yep. the police department, we would want, would want to hear. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, so Richard. Uh, Richard Hume, Pioneer Hill. Uh, just a compliment for the chief uh, following up on Eric Tetzlaff's uh, concern last uh, meeting that uh, Colfax police right. were pulling us over and, and stuff, and uh, you clarified that. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, J.S. Civil Command, Military Hill. Um, don't have anything to report. Amy Newsbaum, Military Hill. I've got nothing. Stephanie Rink, Pullman School District Parent. Nothing. Okay. Greg Wilson, Pioneer Hill. I like to uh, gain your emails. My emails? Yeah. Good job. The, the <laughs> retakes? What are they called? Oh, oh the, the weekly, weekly recaps. Recap. Oh, yeah, okay. I like that. Oh, okay. I, I enjoyed it. I thought you were being serious. I thought he was sarcastic. Like, <laughs> no, no, I really I enjoyed reading that. Are we on the schedule? Yeah, so. I yeah. want to know more about the um, airport incidents. Those, those seem kind of high to me. Well, those, so all that is, I'll explain that to you. It's um, airports are required to have a law enforcement presence for outgoing flights. And um, so like Spokane Airport has their own police department and that's how they address that. Well, Pullman doesn't have their own police departments. They're, the airport yeah. doesn't. So we fill that void. Um, we don't have to be there 100% of the time, but we have to get there uh, for as many outgoing flights as we can, just to have a law enforcement presence uh, when they're doing the, the TSA screening. So uh, every outgoing flight, uh, prior to the flight, we get a uh, reminder notification from dispatch. And so if there's an officer available, they'll go. And that's, so that's called airport security. So that's why there's a high number of those, because we have right now, I think there's four outgoing flights a day. Oh, so those aren't incidents. Those are right. just when you're yep. out there just watching. Right. And, oh, and we include okay. it because it's part of our, our required activity that takes officers yeah. time. It's a dispatch duty. Right. But I just thought those were like incidents. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Well, we, have very, <laughs> That's like we have very few incidents. There's something going on. Okay. Nope. Well, so I missed Pacific Coast Command. Nothing. Okay. Okay. I'm at Sunnyside Hill, Adam Williams, Sunnyside Hill, and I have nothing. Okay, great. I don't think I need a motion to adjourn at this point because we are past our time. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate you all here. And we'll get a reminder email out about our Art Walk event this weekend. And I appreciate you guys volunteering. So.